Chapter Three of The Poison Belt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Poison Belt by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Chapter Three, entitled Submerged. The chamber which was destined to be the scene of our unforgettable experience was a charmingly feminine sitting room, some fourteen or sixteen feet square. At the end of it, divided by a curtain of red velvet, was a small apartment which formed the professor's dressing-room. This, in turn, opened into a large bedroom. The curtain was still hanging, but the boudoir and dressing-room could be taken as one chamber for the purposes of our experiment. One door and the window-frame had been plastered round with varnished paper, so as to be practically sealed. Above the other door, which opened on to the landing, there hung a fanlight which could be drawn by a cord when some ventilation became absolutely necessary. A large shrub in a tub stood in each corner. "'How to get rid of our excessive carbon dioxide without unduly wasting our oxygen is a delicate and vital question,' said Challenger, looking round him after the five iron tubes had been laid side by side against the wall. With longer time for preparation I could have brought the whole concentrated force of my intelligence to bear more fully upon the problem, but as it is we must do what we can. The shrubs will be of some small service. Two of the oxygen tubes are ready to be turned on at an instant's notice, so that we cannot be taken unawares. At the same time it would be well not to go far from the room, as the crisis may be a sudden and urgent one. There was a broad, low window opening out upon a balcony. The view beyond was the same as that which we had already admired from the study. Looking out, I could see no sign of disorder anywhere. There was a road curving down the side of the hill, under my very eyes. A cab from the station, one of those prehistoric survivals, which are only to be found in our country villages, was toiling slowly up the hill. Lower down was a nurse-girl, wheeling a perambulator and leading a second child by the hand. The blue reeks of smoke from the cottages gave the whole widespread landscape an air of settled order and homely comfort. Nowhere in the blue heaven or on the sunlit earth was there any foreshadowing of a catastrophe. The harvesters were back in the fields once more, and the golfers, in pairs and fours, were still streaming round the links. There was so strange a turmoil within my own head, and such a jangling of my overstrung nerves, that the indifference of those people was amazing. "'Those fellows don't seem to feel any ill effects,' said I, pointing down at the links. "'Have you played golf?' asked Lord John. "'No, I have not.' "'Well, young fellow, when you do you'll learn that once fairly out on a round, it would take the crack of doom to stop a true golfer. Hello! There's that telephone bell again. From time to time, during and after lunch, the high, insistent ring had summoned the professor. He gave us the news as it came through to him in a few curt sentences. Such terrific items had never been registered in the world's history before. The great shadow was creeping up from the south like a rising tide of death. Egypt had gone through its delirium and was now comatose. Spain and Portugal, after a wild frenzy in which the clericals and the anarchists had fought most desperately, were now fallen silent. No cable messages were received any longer from South America. In North America the southern states, after some terrible racial rioting, had succumbed to the poison. North of Maryland the effect was not yet marked and in Canada it was hardly perceptible. Belgium, Holland, and Denmark had each in turn been affected. Despairing messages were flashing from every quarter to the great centres of learning, to the chemists and the doctors of worldwide repute, imploring their advice. The astronomers, too, were deluged with inquiries. Nothing could be done. The thing was universal and beyond our human knowledge or control. It was death painless but inevitable, death for young and old, for weak and strong, for rich and poor, without hope or possibility of escape. 
Such was the news which, in scattered, distracted messages, the telephone had brought us. The great cities already knew their fate, and, so far as we could gather, were preparing to meet it with dignity and resignation. Yet here were our golfers and labourers like the lambs who gamble under the shadow of the knife. It seemed amazing. And yet how could they know? It had all come upon us in one giant stride. What was there in the morning paper to alarm them? And now it was but three in the afternoon. Even as we looked some rumour seemed to have spread, for we saw the reapers hurrying from the fields. Some of the golfers were returning to the clubhouse. They were running as if taking refuge from a shower. Their little caddies trailed behind them. Others were continuing their game. The nurse had turned and was pushing her perambulator hurriedly up the hill again. I noticed that she had her hand to her brow. The cab had stopped, and the tired horse, with his head sunk to his knees, was resting. Above there was a perfect summer sky, one huge vault of unbroken blue, save for a few fleecy white clouds over the distant downs. If the human race must die to-day, it was at least upon a glorious deathbed. And yet all that gentle loveliness of nature made this terrific and wholesale destruction the more pitiable and awful. Surely it was too goodly a residence that we should be so swiftly, so ruthlessly evicted from it. But I have said that the telephone bell had rung once more. Suddenly I heard Challenger's tremendous voice from the hall. Malone, he cried, you are wanted. I rushed down to the instrument. It was McArdle speaking from London. "'That you, Mr. Malone?' cried his familiar voice. "'Mr. Malone, there are terrible goings-on in London. For God's sake, see if Professor Challenger can suggest anything that can be done.' "'He can suggest nothing, sir,' I answered. "'He regards the crisis as universal and inevitable.' We have some oxygen here, but it can only defer our fate for a few hours. "'Oxygen!' cried the agonized voice. "'There is no time to get any. The office has been a perfect pandemonium ever since you left in the morning. Now half of the staff are insensible. I am weighed down with heaviness myself. From my window I can see the people lying thick in Fleet Street. The traffic is all held up.' judging by the last telegrams the whole world his voice had been sinking and suddenly stopped an instant later i heard through the telephone a muffled thud as if his head had fallen forward on the desk mr mcardle i cried mr mcardle there was no answer i knew as i replaced the receiver that i should never hear his voice again At that instant, just as I took a step backwards from the telephone, the thing was on us. It was as if we were bathers up to our shoulders in water, who suddenly are submerged by a rolling wave. An invisible hand seemed to have quietly closed round my throat and to be gently pressing the life from me. I was conscious of immense oppression upon my chest, great tightness within my head, a loud singing in my ears, and bright flashes before my eyes. I staggered to the balustrades of the stair. At the same moment, rushing and snorting like a wounded buffalo, Challenger dashed past me, a terrible vision, with red-purple face and gorged eyes and bristling hair. His little wife, insensible to all appearance, was slung over his great shoulder, and he blundered and thundered up the stair, scrambling and tripping, but carrying himself and her through sheer will-force, through that mephitic atmosphere, to the haven of temporary safety. At the sight of his effort I too rushed up the steps, clambering, falling, clutching at the rail, until I tumbled half senseless upon my face on the upper landing. Lord John's fingers of steel were in the collar of my coat, and a moment later I was stretched upon my back, unable to speak or move, on the boudoir carpet. The woman lay beside me, and Summerlee was bunched in a chair by the window, his head nearly touching his knees. As in a dream I saw Challenger, like a monstrous beetle, crawling slowly across the floor, and a moment later I heard the gentle hissing of the escaping oxygen. 
Challenger breathed two or three times with enormous gulps, his lungs roaring as he drew in the vital gas. "'It works!' he cried exultingly. "'My reasoning has been justified!' He was up on his feet again, alert and strong. With a tube in his hand he rushed over to his wife and held it to her face. In a few seconds she moaned, stirred, and sat up. He turned to me, and I felt the tide of life stealing warmly through my arteries. My reason told me that it was but a little respite, and yet, carelessly as we talk of its value, every hour of existence now seemed an inestimable thing. Never have I known such a thrill of sensuous joy as came with that freshet of life. The weight fell away from my lungs, the band loosened from my brow, a sweet feeling of peace and gentle languid comfort stole over me. I lay watching Summerlee revive under the same remedy, and finally Lord John took his turn. He sprang to his feet and gave me a hand to rise, while Challenger picked up his wife and laid her on the settee. "'Oh, George, I am so sorry you brought me back,' she said, holding him by the hand. "'The door of death is indeed, as you said, hung with beautiful, shimmering curtains.' For once the choking feeling had passed, it was all unspeakably soothing and beautiful. Why have you dragged me back? Because I wish that we make the passage together. We have been together so many years. It would be sad to fall apart at the supreme moment. For a moment in his tender voice I caught a glimpse of a new challenger, something very far from the bullying, ranting, arrogant man who had alternately amazed and offended his generation. Here in the shadow of death was the innermost challenger, the man who had won and held a woman's love. Suddenly his mood changed, and he was our strong captain once again. "'Alone of all mankind I saw and foretold this catastrophe,' said he with a ring of exultation and scientific triumph in his voice. "'As to you, my good Summerlee, I trust your last doubts have been resolved as to the meaning of the blurring of the lines in the spectrum, and that you will no longer contend that my letter in the Times was based upon a delusion. For once our pugnacious colleague was deaf to a challenge. He could but sit gasping and stretching his long, thin limbs, as if to assure himself that he was still really upon this planet. Challenger walked across to the oxygen tube, and the sound of the loud hissing fell away till it was the most gentle sibilation. "'We must husband our supply of the gas,' said he. "'The atmosphere of the room is now strongly hyperoxygenated, and I take it that none of us feel any distressing symptoms. We can only determine by actual experiments what amount added to the air will serve to neutralize the poison. Let us see how that will do.' We sat in silent, nervous tension for five minutes or more, observing our own sensations. I had just begun to fancy that I felt the constriction round my temples again, when Mrs. Challenger called out from the sofa that she was fainting. Her husband turned on more gas. "'In pre-scientific days,' said he, "'they used to keep a white mouse in every submarine.' as its more delicate organization gave signs of a vicious atmosphere before it was perceived by the sailors. You, my dear, will be our white mouse. I have now increased the supply, and you are better. Yes, I am better. Possibly we have hit upon the correct mixture. When we have ascertained exactly how little will serve, we shall be able to compute how long we shall be able to exist. Unfortunately, in resuscitating ourselves, we have already consumed a considerable proportion of this first tube. "'Does it matter?' asked Lord John, who was standing with his hands in his pockets, up close to the window. "'If we have to go, what is the use of holding on? You don't suppose there's any chance for us?' Challenger smiled and shook his head. "'Well, then, don't you think there is more dignity in taking the jump and not waiting to be pushed in? If it must be so, I'm for saying our prayers, turning off the gas, and opening the window.' "'Why not?' said the lady bravely. "'Surely, George, Lord John is right, and it is better so.' 
"'I most strongly object,' cried Summerlee in a querulous voice. "'When we must die, let us by all means die. But to deliberately anticipate death seems to me to be a foolish and unjustifiable action.' "'What does our young friend say to it?' asked Challenger. "'I think we should see it to the end.' "'And I am strongly of the same opinion,' said he. "'Then, George, if you say so, I think so, too,' cried the lady. "'Well, well, I'm only a putting it as an argument,' said Lord John. "'If you all want to see it through, I am with you. "'It's deuced interesting, and no mistake about that. "'I've had my share of adventures in my life, "'and as many thrills as most folk, "'but I'm ended on my top note.' "'Granting the continuity of life,' said Challenger. "'A large assumption!' cried Summerlee. Challenger stared at him in silent reproof. "'Granting the continuity of life,' said he in his most didactic manner, "'none of us can predicate what opportunities of observation one may have from what we may call the spirit plane to the plane of matter. It surely must be evident to the most obtuse person,' here he glared at Summerlee, that it is while we are ourselves material that we are most fitted to watch and form a judgment upon material phenomena. Therefore it is only by keeping alive for these few extra hours that we can hope to carry on with us to some future existence a clear conception of the most stupendous event that the world, or the universe so far as we know it, has ever encountered." To me it would seem a deplorable thing that we should in any way curtail by so much as a minute so wonderful an experience. "'I am strongly of the same opinion,' cried Summerlee. "'Carried without a division,' said Lord John. "'By George, that poor devil of a chauffeur of yours down in the yard has made his last journey. No use making a sally and bringing him in?' "'It would be absolute madness!' cried Summerlee. "'Well, I suppose it would,' said Lord John. "'It couldn't help him and would scatter our gas all over the house, even if we ever got back alive. My word! Look at the little birds under the trees!' We drew four chairs up to the long, low window, the lady still resting with closed eyes upon the settee. I remember that the monstrous and grotesque idea crossed my mind. The illusion may have been heightened by the heavy stuffiness of the air which we were breathing, that we were in four front seats of the stalls at the last act of the drama of the world. In the immediate foreground, beneath our very eyes, was the small yard with the half-cleaned motor-car standing in it. Austin, the chauffeur, had received his final notice at last for he was sprawling beside the wheel, with a great black bruise upon his forehead where it had struck the step, or mudguard, in falling. He still held in his hand the nozzle of the hose with which he had been washing down his machine. A couple of small plane trees stood in a corner of the yard, and underneath them lay several pathetic little balls of fluffy feathers, with tiny feet uplifted. The sweep of death's scythe had included everything great and small, within its swath. Over the wall of the yard we looked down upon the winding road, which led to the station. A group of the reapers whom we had seen running from the fields were lying all pell-mell, their bodies crossing each other, at the bottom of it. Farther up, the nurse-girl lay with her head and shoulders propped against the slope of the grassy bank. She had taken the baby from the perambulator, and it was a motionless bundle of wraps in her arms. Close behind her a tiny patch upon the roadside showed where the little boy was stretched. Still nearer to us was the dead cab-horse, kneeling between the shafts. The old driver was hanging over the splashboard like some grotesque scarecrow, his arms dangling absurdly in front of him. Through the window we could dimly discern that a young man was seated inside. The door was swinging open, and his hand was grasping the handle, as if he had attempted to leap forth at the last instant. 
In the middle distance lay the golf links, dotted as they had been in the morning with the dark figures of the golfers, lying motionless upon the grass of the course, or among the heather which skirted it. On one particular green there were eight bodies stretched where a foursome with its caddies had held to their game to the last. No bird flew in the blue vault of heaven, no man or beast moved upon the vast countryside which lay before us. The evening sun shone its peaceful radiance across it, but there brooded over it all the stillness and the silence of universal death, a death in which we were so soon to join. At the present instant, that one frail sheet of glass, by holding in the extra oxygen which counteracted the poisoned ether, shut us off from the fate of all our kind. For a few short hours, the knowledge and foresight of one man could preserve our little oasis of life in the vast desert of death, and save us from participation in the common catastrophe. Then the gas would run low. We too should lie gasping upon that cherry-coloured boudoir carpet, and the fate of the human race, and of all earthly life, would be complete. For a long time, in a mood which was too solemn for speech. We looked out at the tragic world. "'There is a house on fire,' said Challenger at last, pointing to a column of smoke which rose above the trees. "'There will, I expect, be many such, possibly whole cities in flames, when we consider how many folk may have dropped with lights in their hands.' The fact of combustion is in itself enough to show that the proportion of oxygen in the atmosphere is normal, and that it is the ether which is at fault. Ah, there you see another blaze on the top of Crowborough Hill. It is the golf clubhouse, or I am mistaken. There is the church clock chiming the hour. It would interest our philosophers to know that man-made mechanisms have survived the race who made it. By George! cried Lord John, rising excitedly from his chair. "'What's that puff of smoke? It's a train!' We heard the roar of it, and presently it came flying into sight, going at what seemed to me to be a prodigious speed. Whence it had come, or how far, we had no means of knowing. Only by some miracle of luck could it have gone any distance. But now we were to see the terrific end of its career." A train of coal trucks stood motionless upon the line. We held our breath as the express roared along the same track. The crash was horrible. Engine and carriages piled themselves into a hill of splintered wood and twisted iron. Red spurts of flame flickered up from the wreckage until it was all ablaze. For half an hour we sat with hardly a word, stunned by the stupendous sight. "'Poor, poor people!' cried Mrs. Challenger at last, clinging with a whimper to her husband's arm. My dear, the passengers on that train were no more animate than the coals into which they crashed, or the carbon which they have now become, said Challenger, stroking her hand soothingly. It was a train of the living when it left Victoria, but it was driven and freighted by the dead long before it reached its fate. All over the world the same thing must be going on, said I, as a vision of strange happenings rose before me. Think of the ships at sea, how they will steam on and on, until the furnaces die down or until they run full tilt upon some beach. The sailing ships, too, how they will back and fill with their cargoes of dead sailors, while their timbers rot and their joints leak, till one by one they sink below the surface. Perhaps a century hence the Atlantic may still be dotted with the old drifting derelicts. "'And the folk in the coal-mines,' said Summerlee, with a dismal chuckle. "'If ever geologists should by any chance live upon earth again, they will have some strange theories of the existence of man in carboniferous strata.' "'I don't profess to know about such things,' remarked Lord John. But it seems to me the earth will be, to let, empty, after this. When once our human crowd is wiped off it, how will it ever get on again? The world was empty before, Challenger answered gravely. 
under laws which in their inception are beyond and above us, it became peopled. Why may the same process not happen again? My dear Challenger, you can't mean that. I am not in the habit, Professor Summerlee, of saying things which I do not mean. The observation is trivial. Out went the beard, and down came the eyelids. "'Well, you have lived an obstinate dogmatist, and you mean to die one,' said Summerlee, sourly. "'And you, sir, have lived an unimaginative obstructionist, and never can hope now to emerge from it. "'Your worst critics will never accuse you of lacking imagination,' Summerlee retorted. "'Upon my word,' said Lord John. It would be like you if you used up our last gasp of oxygen in abusing each other. What can it matter whether folk come back or not? It surely won't be in our time. In that remark, sir, you betray your own very pronounced limitations, said Challenger severely. The true scientific mind is not to be tied down by its own conditions of time and space. It builds itself an observatory, erected upon the borderline of present, which separates the infinite past from the infinite future. From this sure post, it makes its sallies even to the beginning and to the end of all things. As to death, the scientific mind dies at its post, working in normal and methodic fashion to the end. It disregards so petty a thing as its own physical dissolution, as completely as it does all other limitations upon the plane of matter. Am I right, Professor Summerlee? Summerlee grumbled an ungracious assent. With certain reservations, I agree, said he. The ideal scientific mind, continued Challenger, I put it in the third person rather than appear to be too self-complacent. The ideal scientific mind should be capable of thinking out a point of abstract knowledge in the interval between its owner falling from a balloon and reaching the earth. Men of this strong fibre are needed to form the conquerors of nature and the bodyguard of truth. "'It strikes me nature's on top this time,' said Lord John, looking out of the window. "'I've read some leadin' articles about you gentlemen controllin' her, but she's getting a bit of her own back.' "'It is but a temporary setback,' said Challenger, with conviction." A few million years, what are they in the great cycle of time? The vegetable world has, as you can see, survived. Look at the leaves of that plane tree. The birds are dead, but the plant flourishes. From this vegetable life, in pond and in marsh, will come in time the tiny crawling microscopic slugs which are the pioneers of that great army of life in which, for the instant, we five have the extraordinary duty of serving as rear guard. Once the lowest form of life has established itself, the final advent of man is as certain as the growth of the oak from the acorn. The old circle will swing round once more. But the poison, I asked, will that not nip life in the bud? The poison may be a mere stratum or layer in the ether a mephitic gulf stream across that mighty ocean in which we float. Or tolerance may be established, and life accommodate itself to a new condition. The mere fact that with a comparatively small hyperoxygenation of our blood we can hold out against it is surely a proof in itself that no very great change would be needed to enable animal life to endure it. The smoking house beyond the trees had burst into flame, we could see the high tongues of fire shooting up into the air. "'It's pretty awful,' muttered Lord John, more impressed than I had ever seen him. "'Well, after all, what does it matter?' I remarked. "'The world is dead. Cremation is surely the best burial.' "'It would shorten us up if this house went ablaze.' "'I foresaw the danger,' said Challenger and ask my wife to guard against it. "'Everything is quite safe, dear, but my head begins to throb again. What a dreadful atmosphere!' "'We must change it,' said Challenger. He bent over his cylinder of oxygen. "'It's nearly empty,' 
said he. It has lasted us some three and a half hours. It is now close on eight o'clock. We shall get through the night comfortably. I should expect the end about nine o'clock tomorrow morning. We shall see one sunrise, which shall be all our own. He turned on his second tube, and opened for half a minute the fanlight over the door. Then, as the air became perceptibly better, but our own symptoms more acute, he closed it once again. "'By the way,' said he, "'man does not live upon oxygen alone. It's dinner-time and over. I assure you, gentlemen, that when I invited you to my home, and to what I had hoped would be an interesting reunion, I had intended that my kitchen should justify itself. However, we must do what we can. I am sure that you will agree with me that it would be folly to consume our air too rapidly by lighting an oil-stove. I have some small provision of cold meats, bread, and pickles, which, with a couple of bottles of claret, may serve our turn. Thank you, my dear. Now as ever you are the queen of managers. It was indeed wonderful how, with the self-respect and sense of propriety of the British housekeeper, the lady had within a few minutes adorned the central table with a snow-white cloth, laid the napkins upon it, and set forth the simple meal with all the elegance of civilization, including an electric torch lamp in the centre. Wonderful also was it to find that our appetites were ravenous. "'It is the measure of our emotion,' said Challenger, with that air of condescension with which he brought his scientific mind to the explanation of humble facts. "'We have gone through a great crisis. That means molecular disturbance. That, in turn, means the need for repair. Great sorrow or great joy should bring intense hunger, not abstinence from food.' as our novelists will have it. "'That's why the country folk have great feasts at funerals,' I hazarded. "'Exactly. Our young friend has hit upon an excellent illustration. Let me give you another slice of tongue.' "'The same with savages,' said Lord John, cutting away at the beef. "'I've seen them bearing a chief up the Arawimi River, and they ate a hippo that must have weighed as much as a tribe.' There are some of them down New Guinea way that eat the late lamented himself, just by way of a last tidy-up. Well, of all the funeral feasts on this earth, I suppose the one we are taking is the queerest. The strange thing is, said Mrs. Challenger, that I find it impossible to feel grief for those who are gone. There are my father and mother at Bedford. I know that they are dead and yet in this tremendous universal tragedy I can feel no sharp sorrow for any individuals, even for them. "'And my old mother in her cottage in Ireland,' said I. "'I can see her in my mind's eye, with her shawl and her lace cap, lying back with closed eyes in the old high-backed chair near the window, her glasses and her book beside her. Why should I mourn her? She has passed, and I am passing.' and I may be nearer her in some other life than England is to Ireland. Yet I grieve to think that that dear body is no more. "'As to the body,' remarked Challenger, "'we do not mourn over the parings of our nails, nor the cut locks of our hair, though they were once part of ourselves. Neither does a one-legged man yearn sentimentally over his missing member.' The physical body has rather been a source of pain and fatigue to us. It is the constant index of our limitations. Why, then, should we worry about its detachment from our psychical selves? "'If they can indeed be detached,' Summerlee grumbled. "'But anyhow, universal death is dreadful.' "'As I have already explained,' said Challenger, a universal death must in its nature be far less terrible than an isolated one. "'Same in a battle,' remarked Lord John. "'If you saw a single man lying on that floor with his chest knocked in in a hole in his face, it would turn you sick. But I've seen ten thousand on their backs in the Sudan, and it gave me no such feeling. For when you are making history, the life of any man is too small a thing to worry over.' When a thousand million pass over together, same as happened to-day, 
You can't pick your own particular out of the crowd. I wish it were well over with us, said the lady wistfully. Oh, George, I am so frightened. You'll be the bravest of us all, little lady, when the time comes. I've been a blusterous old husband to you, dear, but you'll just bear in mind that G.E.C. is as he was made and couldn't help himself. After all, you wouldn't have had anyone else. No one in the whole wide world, dear, said she, and put her arms round his bull neck. We three walked to the window and stood amazed at the sight which met our eyes. Darkness had fallen, and the dead world was shrouded in gloom. But right across the southern horizon was one long vivid scarlet streak, waxing and waning in vivid pulses of life, leaping suddenly to a crimson zenith, and then dying down to a glowing line of fire. Luz is ablaze! No, it is Brighton which is burning, said Challenger, stepping across to join us. You can see the curved back of the downs against the glow. That fire is miles on the farther side of it. The whole town must be alight. There were several red glares at different points, and the pile of debris upon the railway line was still smouldering darkly, but they all seemed mere pinpoints of light compared to that monstrous conflagration throbbing beyond the hills. What copy it would have made for the Gazette! Had ever a journalist such an opening and so little chance of using it? The scoop of scoops, and no one to appreciate it. And then, suddenly, the old instinct of recording came over me. If these men of science could be so true to their life's work to the very end, why should not I, in my humble way, be as constant? No human eye might ever rest upon what I had done. But the long night had to be passed somehow, and for me at least, sleep seemed to be out of the question. My notes would help to pass the weary hours and to occupy my thoughts. Thus it is that now I have before me the notebook with its scribbled pages, written confusedly upon my knee in the dim, waning light of our one electric torch. Had I the literary touch, they might have been worthy of the occasion. As it is, they may still serve to bring to other minds the long-drawn emotions and tremors of that awful night. End of chapter